So one second. Hello everyone. You should hopefully see my slides. Um, just before we start, uh, the slides may have taken over all of your screen, but you can resize them so you can see the video at the same time and also ask questions um, during the talk or type questions while watching the talk. Um, so make sure you make use of that. Um, I'm Christian. I'm a kernel engineer working mostly on the upstream kernel. I also maintain various bits and pieces in, in, in the core kernel. Um, and I also maintain and develop uh, Lexi, Lexi, and um, LexiFS. So it's like a uh, Lexi is a container manager essentially, uh, which can scale up to 10,000 uh, of containers. And we develop the user space side and the kernel space side. So often we run into, we either think about new features that we want or need, I think would make life for our users easier and then push them upstream. Um, or we run into bugs that we need to fix um, or that give us ideas for new features and then we implement them in the upstream kernel and then we usually make use, use of them downstream. So, um, what I did over the last two years is, um, or three years, I guess now, is at least once a year when I go to conferences, I sort of give give like a talk where I give a short overview of things that happen in the upstream kernel that I think are relevant for uh, containers and for user space. Doesn't necessarily have to be a feature that is only relevant for containers, but um, I usually try to focus on them. Uh, and so I'm doing the same this year again. Uh, and interestingly, you'd think that development stops at some point, but apparently it doesn't really, so that people always come up with new uh, new ideas. And these are just some of the highlights I picked out. Um, I could make an endless array of slides uh, where I talk about various kernel features, but um, this is just a, a few I'm going to mention. Here. So let's dive right in. So um, one of the things that just very recently got added, um, or one of the uh, things that recently got done, is reworking ProcFS. So if everyone remembers ProcFS, I guess, on Linux, it's a Linux dumping ground for, uh, for I guess, features and information about the whole system. And it's really a dumping ground. Like everybody is adding files to, to proc and so on. So obviously proc has been around for a long time. It's incredibly useful, but it's, it also has a bunch of, uh, a bunch of problems, um, obviously. So uh, it exposes information about specific processes. Uh, it has these proc pit directories and under there you can find, you can read a process memory, you can look at the file descriptors that the process is open and so on. You can look at networking information, which is a whole nother sub directory within that directory. Um, and, but it also exposes system wide information like proc CPU info, proc mem info, proc stat and, um, it also exposes what is known as syscuddles, so you can you can basically tweak the system. You can write, for example, the maximum number of pits that you want to allow on the system, the maximum number of threads that you want to allow on the system, and so on. So um, it's pretty powerful, actually. But uh, it has a bunch of issues, as I've mentioned. One of the, I guess, gravest issues that we had for a long time um, is that you essentially only had a single proc mount per pit namespace. Pit namespace is being relevant, relevant for containers, obviously. Um, so it means once, so there was an internal mount, internal proc mount that was created when a new pit namespace was created. When you mounted proc with a specific set of options, these options became the de, de facto mount options for all instances of proc inside of the pit namespace. Well, that means if you mounted proc again in the same pit namespace, but change the mount option, that mount option would just silently be ignored and not applied. So 
if you had a procfs instance in your pit namespace um, that was mounted uh, by sh and showing all processes on the system and you wanted to mount a second procfs instance and you specified height pit equals two which means hide all of the processes but uh, my own um, then this mount option would be ignored and you would see all processes that's obviously could lead to security issues. It's just also not very nice uh, in general. It's, in, it's incorrect behavior. But there were actually reasons why this had, for a long time at least, why this had to be this way, or at least nobody really bothered in going on fixing this. Um, and another issue was the so-called overmount protection that uh, ProcFS has. So as I said, ProcFS exposes a bunch of information about the whole system. Um, and often you don't necessarily want to expose this information to something like a like a container. Um, this can have two reasons. One, as I said, you can write to some procfs files, um, and if you're a privileged container, you maybe want to block this. So one of the uh, one of the ways you can protect uh, you can protect certain files or certain directories if you want to hide information or just not make them accessible. And this is what user space usually does is overmounting, uh, overmounting, for example, like a Steph null over it or overmounting an empty directory over it, at which point um, all of the files underneath a given directory uh, disappear. Um, but now the kernel is sort of a problem, right? So if you're, if you allow the same file system, in this case, ProcFS or Sisyphus to be mounted again, then all of the mounts, then all of the information that you've hidden under mounts would be exposed. So what the kernel is doing, it's like, no, 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 you can't mount the second ProcFS instance because there is a ProcFS instance mounted that is not fully visible. So meaning it has, for example, hidden mounts. Um, so if you wanted to mount another ProcFS, if you want to run, run, run nested containers, you need and you want to hide other proc, you want to hide information from proc by mounting stuff over certain files or directories. Um, you need to have a fresh secret copy of ProcFS mounted in order for it to be mounted again, um, and that's a, kind of a, was kind of a problem as well. Um, and so luckily, um, someone. Uh, went through the effort of reworking ProcFS and removed the internal ProcFS mount that was, for example, responsible uh, for mount options not being applied. It was basically an implementation detail. And uh, that got removed. So now you can have multiple uh, ProcFS instances within the same pit namespace with different mount options applied, which is great, obviously. And now you can have one instance with height pit equals two, and one uh, mount, uh, one ProcFS instance uh, without it. Um, and a new mount option uh, actually got added, a new, sec well, security option, I guess, uh, had also, has also been added to ProcFS. Uh, height pit equals P traceable, which means uh, only those process processes will be shown in proc that you can actually uh, P trace, uh, which is pretty good. The overmount protection issue is, it's not that the overmount protection issue got removed, obviously, but you can at least mount ProcFS uh, without, without exposing uh, all of the information that you might not want to expose to the container. This is more of a uh, invasive, uh, invasive solution than just overmounting individual files or directories but you can specify uh, the mount option subset and then it takes another sub uh, argument, in this case pit, and it means only mount slash mount, mount proc, but only show the slash proc slash pit directories, don't show anything else. Um, that's obviously great that once there was an implementation, this just goes a long time back called pitfs. This is actually, this is actually the implementation of this, but just as a mount option on proc. So that's great. Um, so you can have multiple ProcFS instances, and you can also mount a restricted view, with restricted version of ProcFS in containers, which is obviously great. But that's hopefully not all we can do with ProcFS in the future. Um, this is not part of the actual patch set right now, if I remember correctly, but this is something that was at least brought up on the list and something that I would like to explore further. So obviously, if you run a container, you uh, often want to expose 
container specific information. You don't want to expose system specific information, right? So if you look at usually um, containers will make use of C groups and you will limit the amount of CPUs it can access, um, the amount of memory is, it can access. You also might want to show a dedicated uptime based on the init process that the container is running. You might also want to show container specific load average, which you can also via complications calculate from uh, C groups. And so the solution that we've been using for a long, long time, I don't know for how many years, is that we've implemented a tiny fuse file system in user space. I've mentioned this right at the beginning of my talk, which is called uh, LXCFS. And what LXCFS is doing, it virtualizes various aspects of PROC. For example, if you start a container and you restrict it to execute on four out of your eight CPUs, LXCFS will be smart enough to uh, to hide this in the CPU, to only show those those four CPU info uh, CPUs in the CPU info file, and it will also make sure that only four CPUs are listed in your proc step file. Uh, this uh, similar, if you restrict memory for that container, LexiFS will take make sure to only show the amount of memory that you actually have available. But it's a user space solution, and while we made it as performant as possible also via some kernel patches actually. Um, it's obviously not an ideal solution. It would be nicer if the kernel had the built-in feature of virtualizing certain aspects of ProcFS. So this is something I definitely uh, would want to explore in, in, the, in the future. And what we probably also, yep. Yep, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll just go on. Um, and so this is something I want to explore in the future. Um, and uh, so this is hopefully something we can discuss at the Linux Blumbers conference, which we will, uh, which will take place in August virtually as well. Um, and the idea is that a certain ProcFS files, it's un at this point it's unclear which files, but um, that certain aspects of ProcFS will be virtualized by the kernel uh, relative to a pit name space, probably relative to C group information. Um, can obvious candidates, uh, CPU info, stat, and mem info. There might be a bunch more. Uptime would be cool, and load average would be cool as well. So if at some point uh, we could end up with a partially virtualized ProcFS, um, that would actually that would actually be uh, pretty great. Um, right. Uh, another big feature that landed just recently, which has also been discussed and worked on for a long, long time. So the ProcFS example I mentioned before, like this is not something new, is that ProcFS needs some sort of changes to accommodate containers um, or something that has been discussed for, uh, for a long time. Um, and similar time namespaces, time namespaces go back at least to 2006 where somebody had a use case for them. Um, but right now they're actually, they've actually become a reality. So you know that we have seven, most people I would assume know that we have seven namespaces in Linux so far, pit namespace, C group namespace, user namespace, IPC namespace, UTS namespace, mount namespace, and network namespace. Um, and they all have their uses uh, when, when building containers, and some of them you might consider essential for containers, and some of them you might think are not essential for containers. Um, but uh, we've added an 8.1, actually, an 8.1, and this is the time namespace. And it virtualizes clock boot time and, and clock monotonic. Um, and you might think, well, what's the use case? Well, one of the biggest use cases, and it's actually the, the people who've also implemented this feature, is CREU, which is checkpoint restore in user space, which is used to checkpoint processes and restore them. And also, and by extension, it's used uh, a lot of container runtime supported um, to checkpoint a container and, for example, move it from one physical host to another physical host, like sending uh, all of the information that CRIU stores on disk um, uh, to over the network to another host and then restoring the process. Um, but that can lead to problems like uh, you can end up in scenarios where, for example, if you move the process to another host, uh, suddenly clock monotonic for the when restoring the process, 
appears to be decreasing and not increasing, which is problematic, obviously, um, and uh, a bunch of other uh, problems that you can run into. So what the time namespace allows you to do is specify um, an offset for clock boot time and clock monotonic to account to make sure that a container sees, uh, sees the correct time or the time uh, that it expects. Uh, and currently, it's not supported. It's like all, most other, all other namespaces are currently supported. Uh, you can specify them when creating the container. So you can specify them with the clone syscall. But this is not the case for uh, time namespaces because we've run out of flags in the legacy clone syscall and we haven't settled on the interface for the new clone three syscall, which uh, we've implemented last year. Um, so this is something which we still need to do. So what you do need to do right now, you need to unshare a time namespace and then you can write the offsets and then you set an S into the namespace again. And then um, you see you have changed the namespace into uh, with the correct offset set. Uh, as I said, it's useful for container migration. One thing I probably should mention because it always uh, people always keep forgetting this is it just can't currently be used to sync time via NTPD. Uh, hopefully I said this right uh, uh, in a container. So this is what people think about. Oh, time namespace, I can run NTPD in the container. No, it's that's not the case. Um, it was briefly considered, but it would make the implementation of time namespaces way more comple complex than uh, what we have, uh, what we have right now. Uh, if somebody has a good use case for it and is willing to do the work, just can probably try your luck and see if that gets upstream. If you really want to run NTPD inside of a container, uh, but yeah, time namespaces. Uh, we have support for it, and um, I'm sure that uh, other container runtimes will pick up uh, time namespaces pretty soon as well. Um, Okay, so this is interesting. This is pretty interesting work. I like the, the next two features I'm going to talk about. Um, both of these features are related to a second syscall interception. I talked about yesterday um, as part of another uh, as part of another talk. You all know SECOM, it's a way to restrict um, syscalls uh, for a container. You can write uh, complex filters. Uh, in SecComp using CBPF, classical BPP, BPF, so not the BPF that you think I'm talking about or most people think I'm talking about. It's not eBPF, extended BPF. It's the predecessor, um, uh, classical BPF. So you can write uh, filters. You can filter syscalls based on the arguments as long as they're not pointers because for SecComp, all pointers are, um, are opaque. And one of the features that we've implemented um, Last year, when I say we, by the way, I mean container people in general. It's not that we've done all of this work. We've done a good chunk of a lot of the work I'm talking about here, but I don't want to give the impression that we're the only ones working on this. Um, but given that I maintain a bunch of this stuff upstream uh, uh, in the kernel or help maintaining it. Um, so the sec we implemented something uh, that extends SecComp syscall interception. So in some ex it's to some extent, um, SecComp always intercepts syscall, right? It's, it's you make an entry into the, you make a, a entry into the kernel uh, for a given syscall. And then before you look up the syscall in the syscall table and perform the syscall, you actually, uh, SecComp gets a say and it can get access to the syscall arguments and so on. And then it can apply the SecComp filter that you have written and then based whether or not you have a allow or deny list, you the, uh, the syscall might be permitted or might be forbidden, might be skipped and so on. But the thing that uh, we had a problem with is that it's not dynamic in the sense that you can't, uh, so once you've loaded that filter, that filter will always do the same thing for, uh, for a given syscall. You cannot change the filter um, easily while the process is running. Um, so we wanted to make SecComp more flexible so that you can outsource decisions about whether or not a given syscall is successful to user space. And this is what we implemented with what is called the SecComp um, notifier. And the SecComp notifier is a type of file descriptor, a file descriptor for a SecComp filter. So when you start a container and it lo loads a SecComp filter, you get a file descriptor for that SecComp filter. You can 
hand off this file descriptor to your container manager process, which can put it into an EPO loop or a general way of getting notifications on a file descriptor uh, from Linux. There are multiple ways how to do this. And then when the container performs a syscall that uh, the filter is triggering on, notification will be generated uh, that the file descriptor, the second file descriptor is ready for reading and your container manager will get notified and then it can use an IOCTL to read syscall information. Well, actually a bunch more information, but it can read information from that file descriptor. And uh, parse through the syscall argument, the arguments the syscall was given. It can even, if it has been given pointer arguments, it can go into the proc pit mem directory, race free, not going to go into the details, and uh, read the memory from, uh, uh, read the memory that uh, the pointer is pointing to. Um, and then it can decide whether or not the syscall is supposed to be successful. It can even emulate the syscall in user space. So you can, if you, for example, inspect the arguments and you see, oh, it's performing a mount syscall for something that I'm fine with this container mounting, then I could mount this file system for the container and then report back, have the kernel report back to the process that actually, yeah, your mount syscall succeeded even though it actually should have um, should have failed. This is a very powerful mechanism to emulate syscalls. And again, if you're interested in hearing more about this, um, I've given a talk about this yesterday, so you can rewatch that video probably. Um, but a bunch of syscalls you can't yet uh, you can't yet intercept which you might want to intercept. Um, and this involves a whole range of syscalls that either return yeah that use file descriptors. So you get it, the container manager, which has the second file descriptor for another process, gets a notification on this file uh, on this file descriptor that a certain syscall has been performed. Think about the connect syscall, and the connect syscall takes a file socket file descriptor or socket file descriptor and an address, and then you can connect that socket to somewhere. Um, and it would be really cool if we could somehow bridge the socket connection, right? The container manager sees that the container wants to connect to a certain address, but the container manager thinks, well, it might be the address you think you want, but actually it's not. I, I'm going to reconnect you to something else. But since these are two distinct processes and usually your container manager and your container don't really share the file descriptor table, that would be kind of weird. You can't really interact with the file descriptor of that container. And also, you can't reopen sockets through uh, through proc. So that's not an option as well. Um, but what is possible, uh, so we came up with a method to basically retrieve a file descriptor from another process, um, which wasn't easily possible so far, at least not for all types of file descriptors. And we added a new syscall uh, which is called PITFD, GetFD, um, which relates to PITFDs, which we'll briefly touch upon a little later. But let's, uh, for now, it suffice to say it's a file descriptor for a process that is a stable reference for a process. And so you can specify this, and then you can retrieve a file descriptor from another process, in this case, for example, from your container. It will be blocked anyway because it's waiting for the kernel uh, to, uh, for SECOM to continue, to allow it to continue the syscall. Um, you can retrieve this file descriptor if it's a socket file descriptor. You can, in, when you intercept the connect syscall, and then you can uh, connect it to wherever you want uh, that container to be connected to. So you can rewrite uh, incoming connections for a container, which is a pretty cool idea. You see that there's a lot of possibilities um, that this actually opens up. Um, that's something I'm pretty excited about. Uh, oh, so, and it's, uh, it's not something, this might be useful outside of SECOM. So this is why we, in this case, we made it a separate syscall. Um, so a bunch of people uh, have uh, registered interest in this syscall independent of SECOM, just getting file descriptors out of another, out of another process. So PDFD GetFD allows you to do this as long as you can p-trace um, the target process. And related to this, also to syscall interception again, is um, injecting file descriptors into a uh, remote process, uh, into another process, remote process, <laughs> into another process. So um, I've talked about connect. Um, you wanna get a file descriptor, wanna get a file descriptor connect connected um, and be done with it. Um, 
But sometimes you also have syscalls that return file descriptors, right? So, for example, open, uh, I guess, and a bunch of others, except, um, and uh, so imagine you're, su you're supervising a process and you don't want it to do the open syscalls itself, either because it's so locked down that it couldn't open open the files, or because you don't just you don't want it to have any direct file system access at all. This is, I guess, a use case in more of in the browser area of things. Um, so you have a broker process which does all of the open calls for you. Um, you want to inject file descriptors into uh, into a given process, and Originally, we wanted to make this a separate syscall as well, because we thought, ah, this might be useful, but uh, this would have been fundamentally, well, it would have been very difficult, uh, which we figured out in the discussion, because Linux has a bunch of close, a bunch of assumptions about uh, about how file descriptor tables, uh, about how file descriptor tables work, and usually one of the uh, fundamental assumptions is you only you can only mess with your own file descriptor table. So you can only install files into your own file descriptor table. You can only close uh, files in your own file descriptor table. This makes things a whole lot easier. And so injecting file descriptors via a syscall into another task is actually a, a bit more involved than you would think it should be or it is. So um, this is actually a feature that is tied to second itself. Uh, Sargon has worked on this, um, or is working on this, and I think it's sitting in Linux Next. I could have probably verified this before, but I think it's Linux Next now. Um, and so what you can do is inject file descriptors uh, uh, into another task via uh, via second. You can specify, you can even, you can do a bunch of cool things. You cannot just add a file descriptor into a task. You can also replace a file descriptor, which is more of a, well, I guess I should, yeah, you can add a file descriptor to a task, and you can also replace a file descriptor. So um, you can swap out. Replacing essentially means the task things file descriptor for refers to dev console, and then you could technically, although this is probably a very bad idea, um, replace that file descriptor for and make it refer to some random file on your on your system. So this is uh, this is actually um, pretty uh, a pretty powerful uh, mechanism, and why we did it with Secomp is I'm, I touched upon I touched upon this is because uh, when Secomp the way it works is the task can install it into its own file descriptor into its own file descriptor table. This is just how Secomp works without going into too much detail. So you don't have this whole problem that you need to inject a file or replace a file descriptor a file from uh, from another task. So Secomp is actually a natural place uh, to be doing this. So injecting file descriptors into another process and retrieving a file descriptor from another process makes the syscall interception feature a bunch, a bunch more powerful than it uh, initially was. And I'm excited to see what uh, what people are going to do with this. We're, um, we're already using it. I know there's interest from uh, various uh, browsers to replace the current implementation of something similar, like that also moderates, for example, open syscalls for uh, various sub-processes or sub-threads they maintain. Um, um, so this is going to be exciting work in the future, and hopefully we'll have more ideas uh, around this and uses around this. Um, next up, we have something uh, that user space has been doing for a long, long time in a really, uh, in a really hacky way because the kernel didn't provide a method of doing this which is probably a lot, true of a lot of features. So closing multiple file descriptors at once. I mean, you know that you can only, uh, you, essentially you can, right now you can close only one file descriptor per syscall via, via close. But often when you, for example, exec VE, when you exec and you, when you exec and you process, um, you want to make sure that all file descriptors apart from a few, usually zero, one, and two, are um, are closed. 
or what sometimes system G is doing, it's reordering file descriptors that's a, that the process is supposed to inherit. And then you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, something, something. And then that's the file descriptors that the process is supposed to inherit when it exits, when it exits. And then everything else is supposed to be, it's supposed to be closed. And the way that most, um, that most of user space implements this is via two solutions, as far as I can tell. So either, you parse to pro, uh, slash proc slash self slash fd and parse out all of the file descriptor numbers and call close on them. Um, so you have the cost of parsing through proc and then calling close on all of the individual file descriptors and you need to repeat this loop in case somebody is injecting or opening new file descriptors if your file descriptor table is shared. Or you just, you, you, you do the hardcore variant of this. You just say everything from three up to I guess 32,000, some high integer number, U int max probably is supposed to be closed and then you just call close and then you exec. That's obviously not ideal. I mean, it's, it's pretty costly. As we all know, hardware bugs have made uh, syscalls significantly faster. Obviously not, but um, syscalls uh, have become more costly. So closing multiple file descriptors at the same time would be, uh, would be pretty cool. So this is why we, currently in the process of adding a new syscall. It's sitting in Linux Next right now, which is called uh, close range. By the way, applications, for example, that, I, that close all fire descriptors um, have a need for this is Python. I've seen it in Rust. It used to be in libc. It's not anymore. They removed one of the loops where they needed this. But there are a bunch of applications that use this, um, that would use this. So we, in the process of adding a new syscall, close range and close range would allow you to uh, close a whole range of file descriptors at the same time, uh, and that's done. The, the kernel does it in one go. It's obviously way more performant. Um, and it also takes a flag. This was also discussed a short while ago, um, close range on share, because what usually happens if you want to make sure uh, that you can, that no one can inject file descriptors while you are closing a bunch of file descriptors. You need to call unshare clone files, which means if you had a shared file descriptor table, um, you now get your own private file descriptor table, and then you can call, you can be sure that nobody is injecting your file descriptors into your file descriptor table, and then you close all the file descriptors, and then you exec VE. And then you can exec. But close range share is is basically doing the same thing. It moves this unshare logic, unsharing the file descriptor table into the kernel itself right before it closes all of the file descriptors. And the neat thing also is that um, it has potentially performance benefits if uh, because we we can only unshare the file descriptor table um, up to like. If you unshare a file descriptor table, it unshares all of your file descriptors. But for example, if you realize that you're closing everything above a certain, uh, if you're closing all file descriptors, um, then you can only unshare up until the lowest boundary and then you don't need to close uh, any of the upper file descriptors. So it potentially has performance benefits. So yeah, um, I'm pretty excited about this because we are, we are having this loop as well, making sure that we don't inherit file descriptors. For example, when we fork helper, pro when we when we spawn helper processes and so on. Um, so we, we, make, uh, we make use of uh, one of the hacky solutions in user space right now. This would be done with the clone response uh, range this call, which is pretty cool. Um, promised that I was going to mention this briefly. Um, so last year we introduced a concept that is not uh, specific to Linux. Um, it has implementations on other, um, uh, on other platforms as well, uh, which is called uh, PitFDs. Well, that's the Linux specific name. There are other names on the other platforms, but um, Basically, the wish is with pit recycling, whereby if you have a low limit on the number of pits on your system, the default limit used to be for a long time, 32,000 something, and you have a system where a lot of processes are created, you could easily uh, end up in a scenario where the process you're thinking you're interacting with has been recycled, especially if it's not directly a child process. You, only, you also couldn't easily observe uh, exit of uh, when another process process exited. There were ways around this, but they were really hacky as well. So we introduced the concept of pit of these, which are file descriptors for processes. So you can get a stable, a stable private uh, 
uh, reference on a process and this allows you to avoid various race conditions because even if that process number is uh, recycled, the PDFD will keep pointing to the original process. You just get e ESArch, which is kernel speak for that process doesn't exist anymore if you try to use it. And you can send signals and so on. One of the things that w we always thought would be useful and we wanted to do, we wanted to use these PDFDs for uh, namespace management as well, meaning you should be able to pass them to the setNS syscall. The setNS syscall is quite important because it it's used every time you want to interact with the, with the namespaces the container is using. You need to call open slash proc slash containers pid and s and then for example user and then you open a file descriptor to the user namespace of the container and then you call setNS on it and then it switches you to the user namespace of, uh, of that container. Um, now think about it. Uh, you need to have this open call and you need to have the set an S call. We're at the point where we're at seven, including the time namespace, we're at eight uh, namespaces. If you don't stash away, uh, if you don't stash away somewhere these, uh, these namespace by the scriptors, uh, you're looking at eight open sequence, eight, eight open syscalls and eight set and syscalls. So you're looking at 16 syscalls to change to all of the namespaces of the container at the same time. That's obviously less than ideal, especially if you think about that some of the namespaces, uh, not a lot, but a few namespaces you can fail to actually attach to. Um, so you could end up in a state where you're half attached to a bunch of namespaces. You're already attached to a bunch of namespaces, but you're not attached to others and you fail, now you're in this, in this weird half state. Um, so we thought, okay, with, with, if we could use PIDFDs, we could also specify multiple namespaces at the same time, and this is what you can actually do. So if you, assuming you have created your container uh, with, the new, uh, with, with clone, and you have requested that a PIDFD be returned to you, and the kernel actually supports it, you can use that PIDFD and then pass it to the set and as syscall, and uh, specify all of the namespace flags that you want, clone user, clone UNS, and clone UPID, and then you get moved into all of the namespaces at the same time, and atomically, which is pretty cool. So if you specify all eight, names, all eight namespaces that the container was spawned with, um, it will, the kernel will make sure, the way we've implemented this is that the kernel will make sure uh, that you succeed in attaching all of those namespaces. And if you succeed in attaching all of those namespaces, it will commit them, and you're attached to all of those namespaces. If you fail to attach to any of those namespaces, the kernel will not have altered a single thing. So if you fail, you have not, you're not in sort of a half switch state. You're still in your original namespaces. Nothing has changed for you. So this is uh, pretty cool. And obviously, I mean, the great advantage, as I said before, it's we're down from 16 syscall to, syscalls to one syscalls. Um, so that's hopefully pretty helpful. Um, what we still need and what I hopefully will implement soonish is a new flag to set an S to all names, uh, yeah, to set an S, uh, all to all namespaces which are different from your own. So, for example, why is this relevant? Um, if I set an S to a user namespace of a given container, I'm, I have a problem, uh, because if that namespace, user namespace is the same as my own, um, then the kernel will not allow me to attach to the user namespace so that I, I can't regain privileges. Tricking the kernel into giving me more privileges, regaining capabilities, essentially. So uh, right now, if you spe specify a bunch of flags and you have clone your user in there, you might fail to attach simply uh, because you're in the same user namespace. So you need to verify that you're in the same user namespace first before attaching. So we should simply add a single flag that encompasses, basically expresses, move me into all of these namespaces. Uh, yeah, move me into all of these namespaces um, uh, that are different from my own. This is future work. Um, and the great thing is that PIDFDs with this become essentially the only token that you need to interact with the container, which hopefully makes it a lot easier. So no more opening proc and so on. Can also set an S2 containers, obviously, if you don't have proc mounted. This is hopefully uh, uh, useful. Um, See, this is where we get into the phase where I have a lot more stuff to talk to, but I need to cut short. Um, 
So uh, another feature we added for 5.7, which has also use case uses. I mean, a lot of the stuff has uses outside of containers, but this one uh, specifically is spawning containers directly into C group. So um, they often use C groups for resource limitation, right? And uh, resource distribution. And what you usually do is when you start a container, you create a new C group for the container and then you fork off a new process. And then at some point when you're done, you move the process into the target C groups actually. People don't realize this involves costly locking in the kernel because you need to take the right side of the C group semaphore that is costly. And it also can, well, obviously that people realize that it can cause accounting jitters. So there is a time where that process lives in the same C group as the parent, as the parent process um, and uh, uses resources from this C group uh, rather than from its target C group. That's usually not a big thing, but if you enter accounting into accounting, um, then this is kind of annoying. So we thought, well, it would be kind of cool if you had a new flag uh, that you could set during with the new clone three syscall and then also specify the target C group that you want this process to be created in. And this is uh, what we added in uh, in 5.7. So uh, you can set the clone into C group flag uh, with clone three, and you can also specify the target C group you want to be uh, moved into. The caveat is it only works with the unified C group. Why? Well, because unified C groups, uh, there is only a single hierarchy in contrast to the legacy C groups where the convention was that each controller like memory, CPU set, and CPU was mounted into a separate hierarchy. Um, and uni unified C groups are the future anyway. So uh, we thought this is the way to go. So you take a unified C group file descriptor, uh, which is your target C group, and then that container gets spawned directly in that target C group. There won't live in the parent C group for any amount of time. It will be, get created right in the target C group. And you don't need to take this costly uh, write, uh, write semaphore lock uh, for C groups. So if you spawn a lot, a lot of containers, uh, this is actually cheaper. Um, other use cases we recently thought might be useful is right now there's a uh, patch set which is called core scheduling, which is up uh, in Linux under discussion, which is uh, was originally thought to target some of the uh, uh, new exploits, MDS exploits that we have seen, LTF1 and so on, uh, by uh, making sure that processes uh, only get scheduled on a specific uh, um, on a specific core. Um, so you, they can't attack each other. It, it's kind of funny because we've a bunch, probably some people have read the paper about crosstalk, which um, <laughs> kind of proved that even with uh, uh, with these scheduling strategies, you will still have issues, but it's still a kind of a nice idea. And if it's going to be C group based, which is at least one of the approaches that is going to be discussed, you, you can create processes right into your target scheduling uh, C group, which is pretty nice for this use case as well. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that I have. Uh, I just want to briefly mention before I close and open up for questions is we have, uh, we want to do shift effects at some point. This is still up for discussion. We have multiple patches that we kind of need to converge um, and come up with an upstream solution for this. So this is still not forgotten. It's just that it takes long. Um, we, uh, we had briefly a discussion about LoopFS, uh, which makes uh, loop devices available in container. We will see if this is going to go anywhere or if we end up with a different solution. Um, and we also will probably come up with a new syscall to change in the new mount API to recursively change mount attributes on a bunch of um, mount points. Uh, but uh, for now, this is a bunch of features that I thought were worth mentioning. There's a ton more. The only thing that helps figuring out which are interesting for use cases is go look at the kernel. Um, and otherwise, I hope I uh, could give you an update of what is happening in container kernel land. Um, and so hit me with questions. Let me see. Um, so I'm just, if it probably fine, if I'm going to read them out loud. So what protections are in place to limit access to, uh, PIDFD, GetFD? Well, um, first of all, it's gated by, uh, 
uh, ptrace may access. So you can only get a file descriptor from another pro process if you have uh, if you can ptrace that uh, process. Um, because if you have ptrace access, you can in hacky ways and uh, convoluted ways you can already do this. So um, Creo is essentially doing something, or at least used to do something similar with what they call parasite code injection. It's not my phrasing, it's Creo's phrasing. But um, so you can already do this with ptrace, but it's very nasty and very hacky. So the, the check right now is if you can ptrace the target task, you can retrieve a file descriptor to it. Um, if you're worried, uh, if you're worried about, um, I'm going to stop the screen share now. If you're worried about um, the syscall in general, probably seccomp. Oops. Can Sedanus manipulate syscall as an array? I'm not quite sure what this means, but I'm going to guess that you mean if you can attach to multiple namespaces at once, and then I'm going to say yes, but I'm otherwise I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. What does the API to inject FD uh, to another process look like? Um, so it's going to be second based. Uh, the current proposal that we have, it's going to be a new IOCTL on, so the second notifier file descriptor that I briefly mentioned um, has a bunch of IOCTLs on it. So one of the IOCTLs is read and another one uh, lets you read a struct from um, that file descriptor. Another one lets you write to the file, to, uh, to the kernel. And RFD uh, would basically be another IOCTL where you could uh, specify a struct that contains a file descriptor that you have opened. Um, and then you can specify, I want this file descriptor to be injected into the target task or replaced. Um, so it's under discussion, of, as I said, it's under discussion of, um, uh, upstream. And for the permission, it's guarded by security file receive, I believe, as well. So, um, should also be guarded by ptrace, I think. I need to verify this again before I'm telling you not, before I'm telling you nonsense. I haven't looked at this patch set in a while. Um, what more complexity would be required to run NTPT in Lexi LexD? Well, you would need to extend the time namespace um, uh, to support a way more advanced of what time namespaces do right now. So actually, uh, kernel work would be involved. Well, that depends. You can run NTPT in the you can run NTPT in a container right now. You just can't sync um, time inside of a container because that aspect is not uh, is is not virtualized. So. It's possible to run NTPD. It's just not possible to use certain features of NTPD. I'm no expert on this. Will the C group have the same accesses of resources once it's passed into the target? Um, uh, so I can briefly reiterate how this works. So you specify the file descriptor for the target C group. Presumably, um, what I would advise if you create that C group, you uh, you set up the limits that you um, that you probably want, or you move the uh, process in there and then apply the limits. The order is up to you. I think with the new unified C group as well. Um, and then the process is restricted uh, is r restricted right. Uh, right from the start. So that's the idea of, of how this will work. So the idea is you don't have a scenario where the, where the process is for a certain, for a really tiny short amount of time before you move it somewhere unrestricted. It's basically restricted. If it's spawned and that C group has some sort of limit set up, then the process is restricted uh, uh, right away. Um, the limit, uh, the permissions, if that's another part of that question. The permissions are the same for when you uh, 
want to move a task into uh, uh, into another C group. So um, it's the same permission checking that would take place when you were to try to write a pitch to a target C group. Same permission checks apply for when you spawn a process directly into a C group. If you don't have permissions to spawn a process in that C group, um, you uh, then your uh, process creation uh, fails. Yeah, so and I think with that, I'm out of time. Um, I hope you found this useful. I will be around in this Slack channel thingy. So you can ask a bunch more questions right there if you want. Otherwise, if you have more questions, you can always uh, write me a mail. I don't promise to respond, but I try to. So thanks. Bye.